right. Welcome back to the Kingsway Podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in. Welcome. We have a guest with us today. Ryan, do you want to introduce our guest? Our guest today stands nine feet tall, <laughs> 800 pounds. This is, uh, I'm describing it for you on Spotify and Apple Podcasts so you can see what he looks like. Um, yeah, his name is John Carrer. I did not lie about any of that information. John, what else do you want to tell us about yourself? So, wow, what an introduction. I'm not sure I've ever oh, had yeah. an introduction quite like that You're before. currently but. a professor at Ozark Christian College uh, teaching biblical languages and OT. Is yeah, right? yeah, 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 all the exciting stuff. So, uh, How many languages yeah. are there in biblical languages? There are three biblical languages. Is yeah. that fun fact? Uh, th- what is the yeah. third? Is it aero, aromatics? Yes. Aromatics. <laughs> yeah, aromatics. Very, very close to aromatics. Is that like yes. Cooking. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Something like that. Right. Very oh cool. Gosh. Which one's your favorite? Hebrew. I mean, yeah. yeah. I had a feeling yeah. Yeah. that was going to be. Yeah. Which is funny because Ryan likes to brew too. And so okay. if that's, you're going to get <laughs> way right. down a rabbit hole <laughs> that we might have a little bit of time for. Actually, let's just let's just say the beginning of this uh, podcast, uh, this relationship spurred and started out of coffee. Uh, uh, kind of. Out of a creative uh, arts, arts academy. Is that when you guys talked yeah. the first so time? There's mm-hmm. a thing that Ozark Christian College where John teaches and maybe went and I went. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, I went there. Yeah. Okay. We all went to Ozark Christian College. And yeah. if you'd like to get this, is not an ad for them. Um, <laughs> However, it is. It's great. It's a little bit of an ad. She wears an Ozark. I love it. This yeah. is seriously not an um, ad. <laughs> yeah. So they have a thing every summer called Creative Arts Academy. And it's for high schoolers and it's for people in the creative arts. So if you're a musician, instrumentalist or vocalist you can be put in a track and put in a band for a whole week yep. and get taught by We're looking some at experts. You, samuel jones sam jones <laughs> yeah um or if you're into graphic design or animation or drama or anything yeah. mm-hmm. like there's probably there's even like creative writing and yep. there, there's a track for you anyway so we were there and i saw john there um and, and the, the stars aligned because we're in the middle of a first samuel series yes and you were like this is an ot guy that will teach us all the things that I've been saying wrong and correct them. Yeah. And you were like, we should get him on the podcast sooner than later. Yeah. To make sure. We were in the middle of the Gospel of John, and I was like, we're floating. <laughs> but as soon as we hit the Old Testament, I was like, we're shoot the flare gun up in the air. We need some. So we came up with some really fun questions to ask you. And uh, some of them have actually come across the podcast multiple times. I know you're probably an avid fan, and you've heard all our podcasts. Can I something like that? Yes. Can I interrupt you? I feel like we didn't actually hear much about him. Yes, we just oh, I want to. I want to ask him questions, but I'm going to start. I'm going to start with something first. Okay. So you're here to answer our questions, but we need to know who you are before we can trust you. Okay. Your so that's question number. I see. Okay. okay. So so we we oh. got into this uh, earlier. You're married. I'm married. Yes, I am married. We have uh, five kids. Yeah, from you're a brave man. Twelve to three. <laughs> yes. Yep. So. Was the big family plan, or was that just kind of just stumbled into it? You know, I wanted three, she wanted four, so we compromised and went and with you five. You went with five. Yes. Yeah, so. perfect compromise. Right. I would have gone three and a half. Vote for us. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, is the fifth one your favorite, or? <laughs> Ooh, uh, yeah. That's a, it depends on the day, I guess. God, yeah. That is yeah. so good, like a yeah. true father of five. So, I'm a yeah. father of three, and that is a great answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, usually at bedtime, my wife says, "Whoever is in bed first is my favorite." Oh, and, uh, yes. that, that usually that, that sounds usually like works. My wife and so. your wife could be friends. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh. awesome. And you graduated from Ozark. What was your degree? Yeah, with? so I did a, a Bachelor of Theology, New Testament. Um, graduated in two thousand six, um, and then yeah, we did. I did a master's program up in Chicago, and then uh, we lived overseas for four years is in the Middle Moody East. Or and, where were you at? Uh, I went to Wheaton. Wheaton, uh, yeah. awesome. Got my master's cool. degree at Wheaton, and then um, we went overseas, and then back to Ozark. So yeah. overseas, yeah. where we were in uh, the Middle East, the Arab Gulf, a little tiny country called Bahrain. So, wow. yeah, I, yeah. I uh, in I guess it'd be 2019. I went to Cairo. So okay, I just went very to Egypt cool. And spent some time with some missionaries over there. And it's okay, very awesome. Yeah, eye opening beyond belief. Yeah, it was really really healthy for me. Yeah, to go. very That's really cool. cool. How long were you guys over there? So we were there for four years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And, and so then, did you have a, a couple of your kids over there? Uh, yeah, both of our girls were born are, were born in Bahrain. So wow. yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. So yeah. is that where 
like Oz, uh, did you speak Aramaic over there? Or like, uh, did they Arabic. S- Arabic? Yeah. Well, we tried. Uh, most of the, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's pretty oh, westernized. I had like one lesson <laughs> in, uh, when I was yeah. there, and I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know our alphabet, or I don't know what a noun is. I'm, sc- right, yeah. I'm screwed. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> no. we, so we, tr- we tried. Most of the signs are, uh, there's a Navy base, a U.S. Navy base there, so all the signs are in English, um, and so, uh, you know, they learn English in school. It's yeah, hard, yeah, it's yeah, hard yeah. to... to get people to speak to you in Arabic. So we learned some, but uh, we were never very good. Yeah, so, no, yeah. no, it's uh, the missionaries that I was spent on there taught how hard it is to learn that. It's very, very challenging language. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, English is challenging in its own way because we have a lot of slang, and right. over there they have a lot of words that are similar that mean two different things if you say it in a masculine or feminine. And, right. And, like, and when, when you say it. In, yeah. Anyway, so uh, they were explaining yeah. a lot of things. You're like, you can look like a fool. Very oh, yes. quickly. Oh, yeah. I was like, that sounds like English. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, so. we're, we're very glad to have you on the podcast. Yeah, excited and to be here. Honored to, honored to hear your answers, and we will we'll tell you whether or not you pass. Okay, at the end. sounds good. Because uh, it's a, definitely a test, right, Ryan? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Because okay. we have 100%. all the right answers. That's what we you're do. assuming. We're <laughs> giving you questions that we actually got the answer from the Lord last night. Okay, yes. awesome. Yeah. So well, this is, so. this is going to be great. <laughs> oh, God. So not the it's going off the rails. Um, uh, so we're back to the to the questions. Let's just start with um, let's start with a fun one because I do think the first question is a great place to start. Yeah, you know, obviously, if you're teaching OT and Hebrew is like your favorite language, you've studied probably a quite a bit of the Old Testament. But what is something that has had the deepest impact? Maybe it's the reason you're teaching OT. Maybe it's the reason why you love Hebrew. What's uh, kind of had the biggest in deepest impact from the Old Testament uh, for you? Yeah. So I think. Um, as I think about the Old Testament, it's not really a story as much as um, just a collection, but the, the Ten Commandments or the Ten Words, I think. Uh, as I've come to understand those a little bit better, it's totally changed the way, I, uh, the way I approach the Old Testament, the way I think about the law, all of that. So, um, you know, I like grew up knowing, you know, I grew up in church. My dad was a preacher. So, mm-hmm. you know, I knew. Too. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm an EK engineer's kid. <laughs> That's great. I love You're it. You're over there by yourself. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I, I knew, you know, yeah, Jesus says the greatest commandment, man, that's so, so great. Mm-hmm. Um, and then reading, like reading the 10 words and um, reading the 10 commandments, trying to, you know, dig in, what is what are these actually saying? It's like, oh, so the first ones are all about like loving God with everything that you have. And then, and then the rest of them are about loving your neighbor as yourself. That sounds familiar. I feel like I've heard that before. Yes. And mm-hmm. just the idea that this is the foundational document for ancient Israel, like this is the way that they're supposed to like think about the whole world. Even, you know, um, in one of the gospels, right? That's what the mm-hmm. uh, teacher says to Jesus. Jesus is like, what's the greatest commandment? And, you know, uh, he's, well, what do you think? And the yeah. teacher gives him that. So I think it's like, this is the way that people thought about the Old Testament, which is not typically yeah. the way we think about it. Um, so I think for me, that's been, that's had the biggest impact to shift, uh, to shift my thinking away from, You know, the Old Testament is just a list of laws and regulations where, Mm -hmm. you know, where I get off track when I'm doing my year Bible reading, you know, that's what the Old Testament is. Yeah. Uh, I hit numbers. Uh Right, right. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Leviticus is like, you know, yeah, you're you're halfway through Leviticus and you're like, this is just weird enough to keep me going. But you get into numbers. numbers, That really is. I'm just That really is the desert. I'm like, this isn't right anyways. Because I didn't read it right. I always, the thing that's kept me going through numbers is that Bob Witte preached a sermon on like Numbers 25, Phineas and the Spear and whatever. And it was so like R-rated enough that I was like, there's might oh, be other so good, good stuff in here. This is like the the Avenger uh, the Expendables prequel or something like <laughs> so good. So does the Shema fit into that? Is that part of that Ten Commandment thing that feel like it connects well, or does the Shema sit separate from those Ten Commandments? Um, it's it's sort of separate. I mean, it comes right after it in Deuteronomy, mm-hmm. um, but I think it kind of helps encapsulate like, okay, so now here's here's these words that you're supposed to live by, mm-hmm. and now so listen. You know, the word Shema just means like listen or hear, right? Yeah. So listen. Um, you're you're supposed to do all of these things. That's supposed mm-hmm. to be a part of your life. So I think, yeah, they're intricately connected. Um, and, I was just curious because yeah. that's some of my favorite stuff is hmm. from the Shaman. Hearing someone like Tim Mackey break it down word by word and walk through that. They had a great series on YouTube on that, which I absolutely loved. And mm-hmm. some of the stuff that 
we've recently talked about is uh, I talked about honoring your your parents a couple years ago. You weren't here yet, a part of Kingsway. I wasn't even born. I, we were having a lot of political divide. I don't know if you heard this. There was political divide. In oh, really? Country. Yeah. Okay. It's been weird. Interesting. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, but a lot of uh, like p- people in their 40s were arguing with their parents in their 60s and 70s. And it, for the first time, it was like we had all these people in our church that were like, I don't really like my parents anymore. And so I had to like try to teach on that. And it was difficult to hmm. teach on what honor looks like yeah. to a 40-year-old, to someone that maybe has a different view on something that has deep impact mm-hmm. on the world around them. Yeah. And it was like one of the closest things where I'm like, we almost feel like like almost like an ancient, you know, um, I would say like stepping into the past of how it would be to step underneath someone that's like a little older, um, that has a little bit more of a position of power because of their eldership they're elder in years whereas these kids are now trying to stand up for themselves have a little independence have an opinion but yet still not be disrespectful right or harsh Mm -hmm. and it was it was a difficult thing to try to talk about even in our family we had a little bit of that too um now what i said and maybe this is just a great thing what i taught and you need to correct me if i taught it wrongly this is where i need to learn we'll get you oh gosh here we go get me um was i taught that 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 um that part of the Old Testament, specifically in the Ten Commandments, when he uses the word honor, and he's talking about honoring, is more about seeing the position that your parents were placed in to bring you into life. And that is a position that always should be honored because they provided that gift to you. So the way that you honor them is not by their performance. It's by their position that God placed them in your life. It's not based on their it's performance. It's not based on their I performance. I see what you're saying. It's yeah. based yeah. on what they gave you. They gave you life. So whether or not your dad's even here anymore, he still provided life for you. And that level of love needs to come from recognizing that position in their life. Yeah, I okay. think that's really good. Yeah. All right. Yeah, Ooh. yeah, we're good. Now, I'm sure yeah. there's way more than that. But it, <clears throat> to a lot of people, it was like trying to just simplify it to go like, Jesus loves you because you reflect him. Yeah. And he, you are part of his creation. And he chose to love you before your performance changed. Yeah. And so I just said, your parents fit that pretty well sometimes yeah. <laughs> like, right so yeah. right know, that that was kind of that that mentality all right yeah. cool well that that's awesome i yeah. love to hear that you have something specific as like the ten commandments is there anything yeah. in the ten commandments that that you were like you should know this i know you said like love god love love other is there like yeah. something that like was that the big thing that like turned turn the coin or is there like something more specific you think people would like love to know about the Ten Commandments? So I think, I mean, there's, there's so many things. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, is, this, is this what we're doing today? Cause okay, here we go. Uh, <laughs> this is it. Yeah. So I like, yeah, I think, you know, what you're talking about with, with honoring your parents, I think even just realizing that the 10, the 10 commandments or 10 words were written to adults. Like they actually weren't written to kids, kids yeah. you know, it's like mm-hmm. to people who have property and people who have wives and people who have mm-hmm. neighbors, you know? And so I think this idea, we, I grew up thinking honor your parents was like a command to, you know, 10 year old John, you know, yes. honor your parents. Actually, no, it's probably more of a command to like 18, 20, 30, yeah. 40 year old John to honor mm-hmm. your parents. So I think mm-hmm. like, I just, you know, hearing you say that, I think that's such a good word, you know, it's like, yeah, this is, it's precisely at the moment when it gets difficult yes. to really honor yeah. your parents, yeah. you know, because you're an adult and you have your own opinions. It's like, that's, pr- that's the moment when God's like, Yes, there's an invitation for you here to selflessly give of yourself. I love that yeah. you just pointed that out. That's been something I've repeated a thousand times over the last year, especially during Corona and all the stuff that happened uh, with politically stuff that, that happened in the midst of all that. But I keep saying, like, I said it a thousand times, and you're so right, but at the ed- at the end of my patience is actually where patience begins. Hmm. At the end of my humility is actually where humility begins. Hmm. At the end of where I want to love, yeah, <laughs> that's where love begins. That's yeah. where it starts. And right. You know, mm-hmm. it's like that's where you go to the place where you go, yeah, you're 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 not just depending on yourself. You're like using what God is trying to plant inside of you and what He's shown you as the right. reason to go further. Yeah. I absolutely yeah. love that. Yeah. And that that's cool that that's that's in the OT people. It's in the old Testament. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's so cool. It's, yeah. Yeah. Um okay, I'm just gonna throw this in. Okay. Why that's extra cool. And it's just descriptive. Mm-hmm. So I took a class in my master's that was on vocation of all people. Yeah. And I was like, what does that even mean? <laughs> and it, it was this, it was based on a couple books, but one book basically said that like in a community, everybody of every age is, is serving the community and has a vocation in the community in some way. And so an, a newborn infant, their vocation 
is to draw out more care from their parents than they thought they had to give. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, transform them and what they thought their limits were. So when you're a middle adult, a young to middle adult, your responsibility to, to the community, to your own family, it becomes to take care of your parents at some point where they used to be taking care of you. Like, like, yeah, they're, they're at the, there's kind of this pyramid slope of power and control and responsibility and when you're at the beginning, when you're a child, you have very little. And when you're a young adult, you're starting to get your own responsibility, but you're under people. When you're a middle adult, you might be taking care of your own children and your own parents at the same time. Yeah. But for them, when they're rounding the corner, they're starting to lose responsibility as they get older and lose and lose ability, lose yeah. some of their power. And so like you're taking care of them as they're hmm. on this downward decline of that. And that is yeah. so cool. It's not like just obey, just do the clear thing. It's like, you're in charge of caring and caring for and tending to your yeah. parents. Well, and the, the, there's a there's a really cool thing in Mexico City that they do, and I know we got to get to some of these other questions. Yeah, we do. Oh but the gosh. the family unit in Mexico City, when I visited, oh, golly, it's been 20 years ago, but uh, they would build their house, yeah. right, and they would build it three stories, and the older generations would stay on the bottom floors because it was easy hmm. for them, and that's mm -hmm. actually where all the family would meet and hang out would be in the lowest story. So they would provide that like the older generation could have that, but the younger generation would go higher up because, you know, they could, they could do mm -hmm. that. Their bodies were younger and it would be, you know, kind of the way. So it was just like almost even their buildings were, were like representations of that idea yeah. of just like, you know, it's a foundation, but it's also the level where it has the least amount of responsibility, but it's where everybody chooses to honor and hang out. And yeah. Be a part of the yeah. Family. That's really cool. So, yeah. Yeah. I think that's so good. Yeah. To honoring, I mean, that's the, that's the word, right? Honor your parents, like, mm -hmm. like give them the, the honor that is theirs, not because yeah, mm -hmm. things that they're doing. So, yeah. Yeah. So let's get to the question that everyone wants to know. Okay. You guys have been asking us that. No, nobody's no, been nobody asking asked. us. This. We've been asking this. Trevor's question. been saying this once a day. <laughs> <laughs> He'll wake up in the middle of the night, cold sweat, I can't asking get this it out question. Of my head, dude. I, and I've been, my dad's a pastor too. I went to him, nothing. And I, I went to some of my other pastor friends and I was like, help me. What's <laughs> going on? Okay. Can you think of any good dads in the Old Testament? And I love how you put this in there. We can't. <laughs> um, yeah. And if it's true that there really isn't any, and I'm going to let you well, answer in just a second. Yeah. Help me understand why. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What, what did you have an answer? Please. So, yeah. So I... This is this is a hard question. Are there any good dads in the Old Testament? So I just like even uh, just thinking through this, I'm like starting to think through, like okay, so let's start at the beginning. Adam, maybe not. Okay, uh, Noah, no, maybe not. Abraham, no. Uh, Isaac, no. Jacob, definitely not. Right? Yeah. So yes, we just like, like we're just moving through and like. So are there? Okay, I don't know if the, I don't know if I can find like really good dads. There's some dads that are less bad than others. Yeah. Mostly because we don't know anything about like how Joseph? they parent. Like, what are we going? Right. <laughs> like <laughs> Joseph. <Righteous> by omission. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Moses. Like, right. But he's circled. Like, like, oh, like no, 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 no. I I think Moses is not in the okay, camp of probably okay. not the greatest. Okay. Uh, but like Aaron. Uh, okay. okay. So he, okay. you know, his sons. But then they got his sons got killed so i don't know uh they didn't you know, stay alive long enough for him to be a bad dad to them <laughs> right maybe that's what it is <laughs> that's uh, terrible. I'm so sorry. uh uh maybe joshua like maybe but yeah. it, again i think it's more of like we just don't know no. yeah anything yeah. about them so is is it man, that's just terrible to say. is it is it a cultural thing like they didn't need descriptions of good dads like is it women raising kids so they're like we don't need to tell dads to raise kids well like, like, I don't, I don't know. I think I just I the way I read the Old Testament, it just seems like the Old Testament is not afraid to just tell it like it is. So to be real, mm -hmm. to be real that this is this happened, right? And I think there are there are moments, yeah, where we we hear things or um, we read things, and culturally for our culture, it sounds like extra bad, but maybe it wasn't as bad for them. Mm -hmm. But I think there's like. There's several things that happens. Like this is objectively bad. Yeah, this was no an objectively like... bad thing that yes. this father did. Yes, uh, and I, I just I think the Old Testament is not uh, 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 it's not editing 
those stories out, it doesn't seem. Yeah. It seems to me that it's saying, nope, this is the way yeah. it happened. And uh, man, isn't it incredible that God was still working in the, midst of, yes. in the midst of all of this? So I think, you know, because so much of their society was was based on, you know, what are the men doing? How are the men leading? We continually are reminded. And just so you know, the men were not the greatest yeah. guys yeah. ever, well, right? Well, that's what I, I mean. I hit like the high notes. Like I'm like, all right, Abraham, the foundation of the new, the first covenant, uh, and he's a horrible dad. Yeah. Like David, a man after God's own heart, his kingdom falls because he's not necessarily a bad dad. He's just absent. Like yeah. he just doesn't do anything. I think oh, yeah. this is one of the biggest issues with dads in the Old Testament is they're absent, right? Yep. Um, when you when you would hope that they would step up and make a decision that would mm-hmm. honor God, they don't, right? Like, so yeah. you got Adam, you got Abraham doing that time and time again. Isaac seems to do that. Yeah. And then, man, Jacob, his his life yeah. is just story after story after story of, where were you, man? Yeah, dude, um, making wrong what, Yeah, why, why didn't you show up in that way, you know, for your kids? So I think if there's any, so a couple. Uh-huh. One, Solomon... Uh, if we're going to say he wrote Proverbs, okay. then I think some of his instructions in Proverbs are the words of a good dad. But I don't think Solomon was that great of a dad yeah. um, mm-hmm. from you know the other books of history he that we probably have. probably had a lot of kids, too. Yeah, so right. Some right. maybe got the good dad. <laughs> right, maybe. <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> so I think, really, then, the only good dad you have is God. Uh, like, he chooses the imagery of uh, the metaphor, right, of a father and son— uh, to describe his relationship with his people. And I wonder if that's even part of it, right? Is uh, It's almost a sharp contrast. Absolutely. That, like, look, I think it's Deuteronomy 1, where he says, like, you saw how the Lord carried you as a father carries his son. Yeah. And God's fathering of Israel is, like, you know, so much better than anything that any of the dads in Scripture do. So do you think it was just frowned upon to, to write about this subject matter? If Because I just don't see David not playing with his kids. I don't see, you know, like Jacob and I don't see them not at least engaging with their kids in some way. I just find it curious that it's never in there in any, you know what I mean? Like in It just feels right. like the highlight reels, but all the highlights are bad yes. or absent. Right. Um, so, because I, I agree with you 100%. If we took this question in the New Testament, I think there's a little bit more evidence to say, like, obviously Jesus recognizes the need for good dads. And like, he yeah. obviously uses the imagery with God and you know, the parable of the lost son and right, some of right. the stuff where he's using himself as kind of this, or the, the, you know, the theme of the thing is kind of like this, mm-hmm. we all need to come home. Like we all want a good dad. Yeah. We all want, you know, this type of thing. And yeah. I mean, wild at heart was a book that got wildly popular, mm-hmm. you know, off of that basis of like the wound of the father. Right. You know, it's like this wound that every dad gives to their son. Yeah. Regardless of how good they are. Yeah. And that God's the only one that can fix that and heal that and can step in and be the dad you really need. Right, right. So I agree with you. Yeah, Hmm. yeah, I think so. I was um, just uh, talking last night uh, to some some friends, and uh, one of the people in our small group that um, was sharing, she was sharing about, I I think she said it was from the shack, um, but she said uh, the comment gets made, right? Uh, Maybe the reason that God is pictured as a father is because... uh, so many people have dad wounds. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just, I had, I never really thought about that before. Um, I thought that was an interesting comment, oh, yeah. um, in light mm-hmm. of this. And it's like, yeah, we, we do. Yeah. Um, so many of us have, have these wounds, right. That we carry around with us from our fathers. And I think God is, yeah, the perfect, the perfect father. I don't know why we don't have yeah. more stories about like, you know, it's and so then David was like, you know, down, yeah. you know, playing lions with his, with his boys, but, uh, we don't. So, I, it's just one of those things that I just find it to be maybe an uh, maybe it's just a cultural slash like writing thing that because that, in my mind it just seems misogynistic like it's just kind of like this like straight up like the women raise the kids the dads go to war you know type of thing and the dads lead mm-hmm. and they don't really need to write about those types of things because it wasn't a part of what they thought was important yeah. and I don't know if that's I can I don't think I can go that far those are pretty assumptions but at the same time I'm just like. Why isn't there like one time where like Isaac like gets off the altar after almost being killed and he's like he hugs him and he's like, I love you, son. I'm so sorry. Yes. We just don't have that. And I'm like, why don't we have that? You know, like, yeah. what? you know, and it, right. just, it just frustrates me because I find myself doing that with my kids all the time. Mm. And I would long to be able to show them that 
that's something that biblical characters did. Too. Right, right, so, yeah. <laughs> right. And I think you know, I've I've been uh, just reading some lately about life in biblical uh, Israel, kind of Israel of the Old Testament, and what it seems like most people say is, yeah, except for those moments when they're off at war, everybody worked at home. Like yeah. your work was at home, so it's probably not like the men leave the house and they go to work at a specific job. It's like, no, everybody is employed. Even the kids are employed there at home. Yeah. Like we got to survive. So we're all part of this. So, yeah, it's you know, culture or carpentry or right. know, whatever it is. Yeah. So there's probably a lot of life on life. And I think you even see that in Proverbs, those first nine chapters or so it's, you know, my son, listen to my instruction. And sometimes my son, listen to the words of your father, listen to yeah. the teaching of your mother. Yeah. Right. Like, it's like, I think yeah, there's this idea where we're both in the home, we're, we're bumping up against you regularly in life. Uh, but even within that, it's like, boy, moms seem to do a better job yeah. in the Bible of, of really taking care of the kids. Tender, and then, there's just no tenderness know. or, or like of <laughs> yeah. compassion at all from a father figure. And, and I don't, I, that sounds terrible. That's why I'm struggling. It's, it's, it sounds it's, terrible to say out it loud. It does sound terrible. And I'm like, you know, no wonder we struggle with men in the church. We've got no good examples. And yeah. It's like, I'm like, why, why don't we have that? And I'm so, even thinking of that story. And, and, uh, I think it's, is it second, second Kings, right? With that, like the boys out in the field with his dad. And he's like, my head, my head. And the dad's like, go see your mom. Yes. Yeah. And he like, goes, <laughs> crawls up in his mom's lap and dies. dies. Yes. You're like, really? Just go see your see mom? Your mom? <laughs> like, see yeah. It. Well, oh, I, okay. I don't know. And, and I think it's something that's worth investigating more. I just, it's been one of those things that I, I constantly am just kind of bumping up against again. And maybe it's just my stage of life where I'm just kind of like longing for a character that I can kind of go, this is what it would look like. This is what, And mm -hmm. all I keep coming back to is like the most was our Christian college answer. I'm like, I guess I got to go to Jesus. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. Like, 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 I guess that's the only example I have. Yeah. Um, well, but, I, I think that's, but I, I think that's actually so helpful because it helps us realize, I mean, the way I read the Old Testament is these are not stories to tell us like, hey, this is... Don't model your life. Yeah, after don't it. model your life after <laughs> yeah. it. Like, don't, please <laughs> do not be like Abraham, yes. right? Like, do not yeah. say, hey, this is my sister when she's actually your, your wife. wife. Right? Yes. Yeah. So that another man takes her and you get rich because he took her, right? right? Yep. Like, this is, these are all bad ideas. <laughs> yep. No. So it's not that we model our lives after them, them because they're these great examples. Instead, it's like, wow, look at how God used For someone sure. so screwed up like like Abraham. So I don't know. I, I, I'm encouraged by just what you're saying that, man, I guess it's just God. I guess yeah. it's just Jesus that well, I got to look to. I mean, it's a it's like, Hebrews yeah. idea, right? We're like, we have these great clouds of witnesses that have, yeah. you know, whatever. And I just, I just wish some of those witnesses had had a little, <laughs> little father in them, you know, like yeah. I just like a little bit more of that. Like, but I, again, I, I'm asking the Bible to do something that maybe um, I'm just like, like you said, I'm trying to transpose something onto a character that I wish I could see that, mm. that really only is found in, in the shape of Jesus. And, and I get yeah. that. I, I just I read a book by Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus by mm. a guy named Nabil Qureshi. Yeah. Did you read that? Have you read I haven't it? read it. Anyway, yeah, but I know what you're talking about. But his dad read the this prayer, this Muslim prayer over him from the moment he was born mm. till the day that he eventually died. And he remembers this prayer. And it was a part of like the Quran culture that you know, the aspects of the Quran he was taught, not mm -hmm. full jihad. But mm. um you know, he was more taught of a, it was a sect of Muslim that actually uh, elevates peace. So it's much more like peace is the ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. um, but he just talked about how his dad, that was like one of the biggest things that he had to get over when he made his conversion from Muslim to Christian was this idea that his dad's faith had, had been such a nurturing, caring, compassionate, mm. kind, genuine thing. Mm. And I was just like, God, we don't have any of that. Like mm. we don't have like a mm -hmm. dad that just prays over his son every day or, you know, I don't know. And so then messes up. And then messes Like, you can mess up, but I mean, yeah. it's just like that. It's just like, where's that little yeah. sign of faithfulness? But then you, then again, you see Jesus is the most faithful of, of all. That mm -hmm. you know, He's praying yeah. constantly going off and praying for his disciples to the very end and, you know, asking for strength for them when he's going to the cross. So right. it's very a fatherly, you know, type thing. Right. It's just discipleship mm -hmm. stuff. And I think there's there's moments, I think, where we see God's God at work and it, it produces this transformation within mm -hmm. these characters. And I think yeah. those can be these cool moments, right? Like we're, I'm just teaching through um, the, we just finished up Judah and the history of ancient Israel or this freshman level uh, mm -hmm. sort of Bible class we teach at Ozark. And, um, you know, talking about Judah, like, Judah's a terrible dude, right? Uh, it's his idea to sell Joseph into slavery. Uh, you know, and then <laughs> and then the very next chapter, Genesis 38, it's all about how he gets married and has these boys, and then they get married to this 
woman and then they get put to death and all of this. It's just a messed up story, right? And then he goes and has, you know, sex with this prostitute at the side of the road. It's yeah, just like, yeah, oh my what goodness. Are you okay. doing? <laughs> yeah. And but then it seems that God uses all of that to sort of redeem his story. So mm-hmm. that by the end of the Joseph narratives, you have Judah saying some stuff that's like, wow, this is a different guy yeah. than Genesis 37. Yeah. And so I think even there it's like, okay, so there was a transformation that happened in him. And I can only think that surely had a positive impact Absolutely. on his family, right? On um, on the generations that came after him, as he's a transformed person. Even Abraham, you know, mm-hmm. as he as he becomes transformed into this new person, you know, in kind of this ultimate test, sacrificing his son. While surely there are some wounds from that, yeah. uh, I think I think it's an example for mm-hmm. the you know the generations that follow. Um, of man, you can. God, God is with us. God walks with us, and God transforms us. He changes. Us. I love it. Yeah. I love it. And uh, you know, and that question is is not meant to be something to like pin you to the wall. And no, no, like, no. That's good. Yeah, the OT's so broke good. it. Yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> it's more of just like it was a curious observation as I'm you know coming into kind of my middle stage of evidently the hardest job ever, which is watching my parents get older and then also trying to raise my own kids and looking mm-hmm. at the dad that my dad was and going like, you did a pretty good job. Like uh, what, what examples did he follow from, you know, and going, mm-hmm. like, yeah. <laughs> great. Um, okay. So let's get into a couple more of these questions. I think this is a healthy one to kind of, we've, we've touched on this a little bit, but it's question number three here is why should we care about the old Testament in our Christian walk? And what does it have that the NT nor the new Testament doesn't? And what gaps does it fill in? Like, is there some things that like if, if a Christian never got the old Testament, and just heard never. about it, never, never read it, never okay, read yeah, it, yeah. never, never didn't have access to it. Just had the New Testament. What's missing from their faith, and is it would it be a tragedy, or would that be helpful in some ways? Yeah. So <laughs> I think it would be a tragedy. I'm not sure everybody would agree with me. What you teach uh, OT, you believe that? I know, right? <laughs> um, yeah. I so personally, because I think uh, the Old Testament teaches us how to think about God and how to think about His world. Um, it's sort of this primer on what has God been doing? How has God been working uh, in all of history? So we can see all of these different ways that God's moving and working and shaping and, and, and transforming uh, different people and events and circumstances all for the sake of his glory. So we get to Jesus, and if, if that's where we start, if we don't know anything about the Old Testament or what happened there. Yeah, you're then a Gentile I, and you just meet him. Right. Uh-huh. It's like, that's an incredible story, mm-hmm. but we're just, you're jumping in to a story, you know, that's, yeah. you're missing three-fourths of it. You yeah. Know? And so I think while there's, it's still a cool story, it's still um, amazingly powerful, you miss some of the depth and mm-hmm. the richness of the story, uh, the beauty of 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 these things that Jesus does, or maybe even the reason why he did some of the strange things that he yeah. did. Um, I think you just miss out on a lot of that stuff. And is it, so. is it pure, like, is it pure, like depth to maybe like atonement theories that come through the old Testament to why Jesus had to come? Is that like, would you say is like the main thread of like, cause we've talked about atonement theories multiple times. And I feel like the OT kind of gives preface to a lot of these really powerful, like you're saying, overarching ideas of why Jesus had to come. Like, you know, mm-hmm. the, 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 the idea that someone's going to come and step on the, the head of the snake and you know, crush it. And, you know, and de- you know mm-hmm. the, type, uh, the type of idea of the like, sacrificial system through the tabernacle and through the temple and why Jesus comes to be that. You know, the idea of the first Adam and the second Adam. Um, you, know, you know, is that, right. is, are those what you're talking about? Or are you more talking about how God's overarching, and maybe you're talking about both, God's overarching perspective of who God is, kind of like the A.T.O. Tozer quote, like, who you think of when you think of God is the most important thing about you. Right. The Old Testament. Are, are you thinking a combination of that, or like what, what what do you run to first? Yeah, I think I would start with the second, is that it, this teaches us how to think about God. Okay. This is God's chosen way of revealing himself to us, to his people. So we find out about who God is by reading the story of the Old Testament and the story of you know how he chose this one people, Israel, and through them, you know, he wants to bless all of the nations. So we learn something crucial about God in that. Now, at the same time, there's all of these other pieces, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Like, uh, there these moments where something is being foreshadowed, or, Mm -hmm. or, or we're looking 
forward to something bigger or greater that's coming at some future point, and I don't think they really understood it. But mm-hmm. yeah. I think Jesus makes so much more sense when we read the Old Testament on its own terms, right? Yeah. As we understand the importance of the Passover sacrifice year after year after year after year in Israel, then Jesus dying as a Passover sacrifice makes so much more sense, you know? Yeah. Or so I mean, this is off, off, off the uh, list. So I'm off the cuff. Whew. Uh, why did why did they why did they they miss it then? Why did Israel miss it? If this was something we can see so clearly now, obviously with Jesus, but it feels like that perspective was it just missed through those Old Testament narratives that Jesus was who they're looking for? Was there not enough clues? Uh, yeah. Well, like, I think the more I the more I read the Old Testament, the more it seems that there were some texts that were clearly. Uh, quote unquote messianic, right? Yeah. So, okay, Daniel chapter seven, maybe mm-hmm. Psalm chapter two. Yeah. These are texts, you know, the Son of Man coming in power, yeah, and you know, all nations will serve him. And it's like, okay, had there too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and uh, you know, for unto us a child is born, uh-huh. um, and the government will be on his shoulders. Like, oh yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. This Messiah is going to come, and he's going to rule, and it's going to be awesome. He's going to reign. Uh, he's going to, um, you know, totally take charge of these other rulers. Psalm chapter two, right? Um, uh, the one enthroned in heaven laughs and scoffs at these rulers of the earth. It's like, yes, it's this him. is the kind of Messiah we want. Yeah. But then you've got these other texts, right, that maybe don't actually mention the name Messiah, but uh, like Isaiah 53, yeah. uh, the suffering mm. individual. The and suffering servant. Even right. as you look through as you look through some Jewish literature, like leading up to the time of Jesus, they're wrestling with this. They're like, okay, what do we do with this? The Septuagint, uh, this Greek translation of, of the Old Testament before the time of Jesus, they were kind of wrestling with it. There's an Aramaic translation of the Old Testament called the Targum, probably from before, before the time of Jesus. And they're like, they're changing weird stuff about it. They're like making him not really suffer. It's, it's, it's yeah. really strange. You can yeah. see them. They're like, we don't know what to do with this. We're trying to understand it. And as far as I can tell, like Jesus is the first Messiah figure who interprets his his sort of vocation, his ministry through the lens of Isaiah 53. Like, I am the one who suffers. I don't think anybody was doing that before. Yeah. So Why all, would you? Right, <laughs> Why right. Why would anybody come and go, this is what I'm going to do? Yeah. I mean, even <laughs> once Jesus, yeah, even once Jesus raises from the dead, right, his disciples were like, all right, so is this so the time? Now? now? Yeah. But now you're going to restore the, the kingdom? Have yeah. Yeah. The a little we, bit, just, yeah. we watched uh, every single episode and did review on every single episode. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And we yeah. just we just so finished good. it. It was really fun. But you can see that in his disciples through yeah. the whole show. There's, right. The best part is I've always heard of the disciple Simon the Zealot. Uh-huh. And I never once in my mind, I learned about the Zealots as a separate thing. <laughs> never once in my mind did I connect like, yeah, Simon's out there trying to stab people. <laughs> so um, when they think of the militant Jesus, yeah. Simon's yep. like, I'm ready. It's yeah. like, <laughs> like we're going to kill him. He's yeah. like, let's cool it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, hang on a second. <laughs> All right, let's take a step back. So, yeah, yeah I think there's there's uh, a, a piece of this, right, where we um, they read the Old Testament as, yes, God is still moving, God's going to work. I think they had a very robust, bust theology of what the Messiah was going to be. It just was, it was very narrow in scope. Like, mm-hmm. like they had a, a so rich very, idea. It's but like it was this like, naturali- nationalism had kind of infected the idea that it was going to be for the nations, if that makes sense. Like they were more thinking the Messiah was going to rescue Israel, Israel right. rather than it was going to rescue the world. Right. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, I, in reading the Old Testament, it's like, you can see how they got there. Yeah. You know, there's some of these yeah. texts that talk about, you know, Israel is going to do this, and then Israel is going to conquer the other the yeah. other nations around them, you know, and like, that's what the Messiah is going to do. And so I think it's it was hard for them to make that shift. Oh, it's like, yeah. you know, in... Uh, that, yeah, that's what I appreciate yeah. about uh, watching The Chosen is, is some of these ways that they're picking up on some of that. Like, you know, even some of the stuff Peter says, he's like, yeah, he's doing that. Can you believe that? Like, it's <laughs> yeah, like, he's yeah. like you ha- you're you clueless. You have no <laughs> yeah, idea what's yeah, happening. Yeah. He's like, I don't know why this is happening, but it's happening. And then Peter yeah. later is just like, yeah, get used to it. This is just how he is. Yeah, right. Like, yeah. Right. He's like, I have no idea what's happening. I think that's how he likes it. You yeah. Know? Like, yeah. Know? It's, like, it's just yeah. the way he prefers it. Right. And so I think there's there's something about this. Jesus literally said... I'm going to die. Mm-hmm. And then he died. And they were like, what, what? just happened? <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> like, I don't know how you missed that. But there's something about, you know, uh, Luke 24, right? Jesus walking on the road to Emmaus uh, yeah, and, awesome. and sees these, these uh, you know, Cleopas and his, his companion. And, and mm-hmm. they begin talking and he begins unpacking for them uh, the story of what happened. And it's like their hearts are burning. 
uh, within them. And then he opens their eyes. And it's like During when he opens those eyes. So cool. Yeah, Dude, yeah, so right. Cool. <laughs> uh, it's like, wow, this is incredible. Uh, but it, it takes him, even after all of these events has occur- have occurred, it's like he has to give them this like interpretive key yeah. to open the Old Testament so that they can understand it. So, so that, that brings me back to that's why you enjoy the OT is because you feel like we have the key now. And right. going back. You yeah. see this as something that is full of ways to understand and, and better interpret or better see the New Testament as the fullness of who God is. Right. And I think it's it's even less of, uh, you know, so therefore this one piece connects to this one piece here. It's more of like, man, the whole story, mm-hmm. if we can understand it the way Jesus seems to have yeah. understood it, that whole story really is pointing forward to this grand thing that God's going to do. And like, yes, it includes suffering and it includes death and it includes pain, mm-hmm. but it also and includes broken like, people. Yeah, yeah. God <laughs> doing ama- something amazing through yeah. it all. So sound like Tim. I want to include this sub question, but yeah. we are running out of time. So that's okay. Uh, answer this as quickly, but thoroughly as you can. Um, so the old Testament is beneficial in that way of really deepening, um, deepening how we see what the New Testament was doing, what Jesus was doing, and even what what God's entire plan was. Like you can see him working, and it's not like he just started with Jesus. That being said, for a totally new Christian, how how would you suggest they engage with the Old Testament? How soon? This is like, it seems like a blasphemous question, but like... (laughs) Like I don't How think they should start soon. at Leviticus, <laughs> right? Like right. If they don't know much well, about Jesus. Well, people normally like, just go, "I'll just start at the beginning," and, and they I'm go like, to Genesis, I'll never make it. Yeah, <laughs> and you're like, "Okay, start reading from Genesis, skip chapters, um, like oh, 19? Yeah, is that one crazy? Yeah, just skip that. Uh, skip like a few other select, like just forget about them. Um, yeah, like how how should they start the journey to where they end the journey? getting to the depths of the Old Testament and seeing the plan of God is richer. Right. I think it's probably wise, uh, you know, for a brand new believer to not, yeah, go to Leviticus or Ezekiel or maybe like the long uh, speeches in Job, right? Mm -hmm. Like these are probably not the places Mm -hmm. to like go hang out. Um, At the same time, I think if you're interested in it, then read it. Like if it can hold your interest if something in the Bible holds your interest, like I'm like, yeah, go for it. Mm-hmm. Try to understand it. And some of this stuff is so strange and so weird, but at the same time, I think it'd be really encouraging for people maybe who feel like, well, yeah, the whole Bible is just like, you know, all of these Bible people doing mm-hmm. Bible things and they're like all perfect. And then you start reading these stories. You're like, oh my goodness, these people were I can't screwed find up. A single yeah. perfect person. Right. <laughs> like where, where are the good dads? Right. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, yeah. wait. So maybe this, this story actually helps me understand things in a different way or it makes me understand like maybe, yeah, maybe that means that God could redeem my yeah. messed up story. You know, even like stuff, you know, that might be to us kind of complicated, right? Like some of the Psalms that are, strange or 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 like know. david's that are like really really r-rated and yeah horrible. yeah right like, at the same time it, babies on rocks right right here? psalm 137 <laughs> yeah. look it up it's great uh some of that stuff you know for some people may may just be like wow that gives voice to oh, yeah. something yeah. i've been feeling yeah. or, or or this piece yeah. so i don't know i think it's it's the word of god and the spirit working within us has a way of of uh, you know, illuminating different you're things. Such an OT and professor. I love it <laughs> so much. Like so, I hear that, I'm like, you're so, so right. right, and I just I don't know why I jump over that answer, it, but I'm like, you're so right. I was like, I wanted to ask it. At the same time, I remember Michael DeFazio from like day two of my entire degree here saying the Holy Spirit can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, however he wants, with or without your permission. Yeah, so I know, of course, course like, yeah. there's no, like, never read certain books and until you're, you're, well, except for some And you're so right. Never read certain books until you're a certain age or whatever. But, like, yeah. Okay. I, I just think, I think you're so right, though, because my journey started with Job. Hmm. And it was learning that Job was older than Genesis, you know, hmm. basically in the yeah. narrative. And yeah. it's like, so the first question was, what do I do with my pain? Like that was legitimately the first question. Does God care about my pain? Right. And why am I in pain? And yeah. what do mm-hmm. I do with this suffering? Like that's actually the oldest question yeah. in the Bible. Yeah. I mean, and so then I'm like, oh, Genesis seems like a really good answer. 
Yeah. Yeah. Where it's like, it's like, yeah, you know why you're in pain? Because you messed up. Like, yeah. you, you know, yeah. because the world's broken. This wasn't the intended way right. that the world was supposed to be. Right. Because he gave and, you everything and you wanted more. <laughs> yes. Well, and that's that. That's a, I love C.S. Lewis's description of that, which is you get everything you wanted and, and it causes other people to not get what they want. So you have to isolate yourself mm. more and more. So in the end, you have everything you ever wanted, no one to share it with. Mm. And that's a lot of times what the world looks like these days. Yeah. And yeah. so you try to fight for everything you can get, and in the end, it isolates you from others mm. that can't have the same. So, I, you know, I agree with you. I, Job is a horrible place to start. <laughs> yeah. It's not necessarily like... Well, <laughs> even then, it's like, well, I think the beginning chapters are really yeah. important, and the end chapters oh, are really yeah. important. But then you have all of these middle chapters where it's like, the friends are like, and it's because of this. And then mm. you're like, what are you talking, talking about? about? And then <laughs> Job responds, and you're like, I'm, I'm so confused. What's happening? So yeah. some of those, like, maybe uh-huh. skip some of those. But yep. the story of Job, I think, is one of the most relevant absolutely. stories for our time. So, like, absolutely, I would <laughs> encourage a new Christian to read Job, you know? Yep. So it's, it's just, it's hard yeah. to know. Um, but I think, you know, the word for a new Christian diving into the Old Testament would be like, okay, it's weird. Yeah, you just need to know no, it's, it's weird. weird. Yes, yeah. Like, and and, well, and it's and it's the other thing that I I feel like if I I'm not the Old Testament professor, um, if I were gonna like give a new Christian the okay, say like yeah, just dive in and and whatever piques your interest, whatever, I feel like I would have to preface it with like what we've said. Not all of these people, pretty much none of them, are good examples. Not all of these like the only hero in any of these stories is God. So, like, don't take any of this as, like, you should go out and do that. Yeah. Well, we just finished don't that. Don't take in, these in as the first final Samuel word. chapter 5 or whatever it is where the tab, you know, the basically the Ark of the Covenant's been taken. Four, yeah, yeah. And, and, they're, and God just defeats oh, their, five. you know, God defeats Dagon on his own yeah. without an army. He's just yeah. like, you know, I'll just take out the Philistines by myself. And uh, I'll, he's I'll, doing the know, whole. I'll, don't worry about it. You know, I, I love crazy. that story. I was like, yeah. he's doing the whole <laughs> Exodus 10 through 20-ish. Yeah. plagues and fighting <laughs> Egypt. But like if Moses never did that and the burning bush just like rolled <laughs> in, then that's like, yep. like you didn't need anybody. Right. Yeah. Right. Which is, you know, even within that story, right. Uh, there's this, this key uh, word kind of throughout this whole narrative, uh, this word kavod or kabed uh, to be heavy. So uh, they brought the ark, which was the glory of Israel mm-hmm. into battle. Right. And then Eli heard the news, but because he was kabed, because he was heavy, <laughs> right, uh-huh. he like fell, falls and dies. And then the, uh, you know, the woman has the baby, right? Mm-hmm. And she goes into labor because she hears the, and she names the baby a kavod. Where is the glory? Ichabod. Yeah. And that's the question, I think, hanging over the narrative. It's like, oh no, for the first time in, since Israel has entered the promised land, they've lost the ark. Well, Where is the glory? Where is it gone? And then the Philistines feel God heavy. Is it, yeah. it, it God laid okay. heavy on yes. them, right? Yes, yes, right. Yes, like, like he, yeah. God laid heavy. He cavoted on the right. Philistines, right. which is crazy. So this, yeah. that, that is such a—I didn't notice that. It's like, how, yeah. how, how is God doing? Like, how, where's the glory of God? And it's like, you, re, you keep reading, and it's like— Oh, God's just fine. Like yeah. he's doing, yeah. he's, he's doing great. all right. Like, right. No worries. Israel, here. I'm not so sure, but God, God's yeah. all right. Yeah. It's like Israel's the rest of the Avengers, and God is Captain America in the elevator with all the hydr. This is so deep. Okay. <laughs> anyway, and like that famous scene where they're like, "Okay, let's get him." There's 20 of us in this elevator, and just him, and he just like whoops him. So oh here's here's the, the thought that I want to end with because I, I think this is just my favorite question to ask anybody that studies something on a regular basis. I know you already mentioned the Ten Commandments, but if there was one passage or one thing you could reclaim, reteach, have people mm. go, you know what? I really want you to know that this is in the Old Testament. It's worth your time to check yeah. it out. Something that they've either forgotten uh, yes. or like distorted. So we were talking about Jonah yeah. before and yeah. uh, what Tim Mackey did with it when he taught through it and whatever. Yeah. How, how it was like, you've known it this way, but you've known it wrong. Yeah. Hmm. It's actually this way. Or just or saying, like, you, you, you don't recognize how powerful this really yeah. is. So I think if there's one thing that I think we should try to reclaim, it's um, an understanding of the law yeah. as outright law. I love that you said that, because you said it earlier, and I was like, explain that. I really want to know. So even the phrase, we use Ten Commandments, right? Mm-hmm. The word in Hebrew is actually words, ten words. It's not commandments. There's a word for commandments that means like, you know, explicit, outright, thou shalt. That's not what it is. But it's not 10 single words, is it? Or is it 10 single words? No, the it's... It's, it's a plural, but word. Right. It's like, I'm giving a word to you. Yes. Okay. Like that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and I think you could say the word uh, in Hebrew for word could has a sort of wide variety of meaning. 
um, here maybe like 10 principles. Yeah, and, axioms. Yeah, and by principles, it doesn't mean like, so these are optional. It's like, yeah. no, do not murder. That's pretty much an not understood an thing. Like we <laughs> we get that. But it's, it's, it's not so much outright law that we think of law, like um, a school bus shall not just drive over railroad tracks. They must stop. And if they don't, right, then there's these like consequences. It's yeah. like, well, I'm not sure that's a good way for us to think about what we have as the as the law. The word that most gets translated as law in um, in Hebrew is Torah, which a lot of us are familiar with that word, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's what the the um, Jews call their first five books of the Old yes. Testament, the Torah, mm-hmm. right? Or sometimes the whole thing, the Torah. Um, it just means instruction. So here's here's why this matters. I think if if we think about it as law, then it's a list of do's and don'ts, right? So God tells me. God's this, you know, cosmic killjoy, and he's always out to just destroy any mm-hmm. fun I want to have, right? And so all these terrible things, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Instead, I think it's, no, these are these are like instructions that God is giving for living a good life. And man, if there's one book I think we need to reclaim, this is such an Old, old Testament professor answer, but it's the book of Deuteronomy. Yeah. Like, I love the book of Deuteronomy. And yes, sometimes it's, it's strange and boring, uh, but at the same time, Moses says, like, like this, these are words that you will live by. Like this, do this, hear this, and you'll have life. And it's like Moses is a preacher when yeah. he, we get to the book of Deuteronomy. He's just like, you know, he's reached the end of his life and he's like, I got some things to say. So listen up. And then, you know, here we are like 32 chapters later. He's like, I'm going to sing now. All right. Yeah. And, and it's <laughs> all of these words are just, they're so good and so rich. And I think they're, they're not intended to box people in as much as help give people a framework for how they might be able to understand life. Like the more I read the law, the more I find myself realizing this is what God actually cares about. Mm -hmm. Like my values are shifting and changing as I soak myself in the law. I think it's, it's, it's the only reason Psalm one makes any sense. Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in sit with, with bad people, but his delight is in the Torah of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And on his Torah, he meditates day and night. Like, I don't think that means, you know, he's like, all about reading, reading like the, rules. right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, wow, you're weird. I think it's, it's no, he's soaking himself in this because by soaking yourself in the instruction of God, you become someone who understands the character of God. And as you understand the way that God has set up the world and the way that God has um, revealed himself, you become a person who then arranges his whole day based on who God is and what God has done. And now I begin to like see that person not as like an agenda or a project or a way to get what I want, but I actually see them as like, no, I care about them. I'm, I'm concerned about the best interest of that person. Like I'm always looking for the best interest of someone else. And when I start to do that in everything in my life, then my life becomes like a tree planted by streams of water that gives its fruit within season. You Mm -hmm. know, it's like, the, the Lord time. watches yeah. over mm-hmm. the the way of the righteous, you know. Yeah. Um, so I just I think if we if we could shift that, I hate the way that we've thought about law. It seems like in the church where we've made it this sort of yeah like a manual mm-hmm. or or mm-hmm. some sort of like law book or law code, and I just don't think that's what it is. I don't think that's even the way it functioned within Israel. It's like yeah. this is God's good word to his people. We quote, I I quote Deuteronomy 6 all the time um, because I do think it's like one of the best passages for parents Hmm. to like recognize how the Bible is supposed to come across. It's not family devos. It should be in every aspect of your life. There should just be flowing and teaching and talking. I I had my youngest son in the McDonald's drive-thru a couple days ago and we took the outer lane of the two lanes. I don't know if you've ever made that mistake or if your family's above McDonald's, but mine isn't. (laughs) No, Um, we are not above McDonald's. (laughs) So we took the outer lane, which means you're going to get four cars going in front of you before you ever actually get to go and pay for your food. Mm -hmm. And so my five-year-old or my nearly six-year-old picks up on this. He's like, these people keep taking our spot. And like he's in the back and I'm like, I know, you know, like I'm trying to be patient. And I, he goes, well, next time you take it, you know, like he's like trying to like backseat drive at yeah. like six years old. Why don't you call but, down you know, fire? I, like, I, need, I need my chicken nuggets, like, dad. I was like, you know, like, you're right. But what if we chose to be kind and let them go first? And I was trying to like use it as an instruction. And he's like, I don't want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he was like straight up like, I don't want to do that. I want to go. And I was like, but this is, you know, we, we, we have a specific prayer that we pray every night. And that's to be kind and generous and to think of others first. And so I was like, what if this is a chance for us to be kind? He's like, 
I'll let you decide. And I said, I was like, I'll let you decide whether we go and whatever. And he's like, I guess we can let him go. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it was just like a fun moment. And I'm like, that's Deuteronomy 6. Yeah. In my mind. So I, you didn't know this. So we didn't set this up. Our vision of our church is John 10, 10. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come to give hmm. life, life to the full. full. Yeah. And so our whole goal is to see that God's cosmic dream for our life is not some killjoy mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. not some list of rules that we have to follow to keep them happy mm -hmm. but it's actually a code of conduct a way to live that provides life yeah to the full yeah and that looks good. like loving god and yeah. loving others well right and that i believe is in the old testament as yeah. you've proven in the ten commandments yeah that's also in deuteronomy <laughs> and exodus 20 <laughs> and yeah exodus. you know and, and so i think there's just a part of that that you're you're absolutely connected and that the image that is in the ot has yeah. absolutely been personified mm -hmm. in perfection in jesus but mm -hmm. is the same image of the unseen god yeah. yeah so that is that is cool and i love that that connected to i, I probably preach yeah. that 10 times a year. Probably <laughs> preach that 10, 10 yeah, times. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah I like that. Though. Yeah. So I, I really That's appreciate cool. your time. Thank yeah, you for sure. So much yeah. for coming. Um, you can give a shout out now to anybody that you want. Your mom's probably watching. Yeah. 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 Pro probably. My wife, yeah. My wife never yeah. listens to any of these either. <laughs> <laughs> no, I seriously appreciate any chance to just talk about the stuff that I care deeply about. So, uh, appreciate what you guys are doing and yeah. appreciate that you care about the old Testament. So. Oh, well, we're trying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I care. I know you do. I'm <laughs> with you. Uh, right. Yeah. Hey, uh, if you're listening and you're on Apple Podcasts or on Android Podcasts of any kind. Or Spotify. Or Spotify. Feel free to leave us a review. It helps our podcast grow. It helps other people find us. If you're on uh, YouTube, subscribe. Hit the like button. Helps the algorithm. Helps us. If, if you're on YouTube, actually make a response video to this. Talking about <laughs> everything we did wrong. That will also help people find us. Also, you can leave a comment uh, if you yeah. would like to leave a comment. <laughs> hey, uh, thanks so much for listening. I hope you found this uh, engaging and uh, edifying and also educational. I know I did. And uh, we'll see you uh, back here next week. Have a great glorious day in the Lord. See you later. See ya. See ya.